from time to time I remark about the working of providence, how certain holidays, holy days, whatever, some things may have occur at the same time when certain epistles and gospels occur for Sunday masses. And these are not by happenstance, I don't see them that way, but I see them as acts of providence, as the works of God to teach us and to bring forth maybe on these special days some extra points of consideration so that these special days can be even more special for us and we can draw further graces from them for the needs that we have. I look at today's epistle. This is a part of St. Peter's first epistle that he wrote, if you want to call it his first encyclical as the Pope, the first one ever written, um, that he had written in, in that way to the church at large, encouraging people through all the things that he had said toward a practice and point of virtue. And as he came close to the end of his epistle, he was encouraging the people as he wrote to be vigilant, to be watchful. He said to be humble in the mighty hand of God. You know, that, that when God comes, when he visits us, which can usually be with trials and difficulties, that if we're humble in receiving these things, God will exalt us. He will demonstrate just how much care he has for us under great times like that. St. Peter gives a counsel here, a counsel which tells us to be sober and watchful. The sobriety he's talking about here is not being, you know, not being drunk with wine or liquor or things of that nature. The sobriety he's talking about here is having a maturity about ourselves, that our emotions are under control, that we have a prayerful spirit in all the situations of life. He said we need this kind of vigilance, this sobriety, if you will. We need it because the devil is out there trying to attract everybody, attacking anyone who is out there. Every one of us is fair game, if you will, to the devil. And he prowls around, as St. Peter says. Prowls around as one who is trying to devour souls. You know, not just to whisper things in ears, but actually devour souls. And he says, whom resist ye, strong in faith. Resist him. There's no greater thoughts and counsels and ideas that I can think of for Father's Day than these words of St. Peter. There's other points that come up just in today's epistle and other parts of this entire epistle that St. Peter writes that are very informative, very inspiring, very instructive to all of us. But today, for Father's Day, to have these points of consideration here, to have the, this great description of what adult behavior is, and not just adult behavior, but when we talk about fathers and fatherhood and the works of fathers in their, as husbands and, and fathers and families, what it is that they are to do, the graces that, are, that can be gained by them, the duties that they have, how they can be able to make those duties or their family life even better and well, and the things they do, they do spiritually, personally, themselves. So many wonderful and important things that can come from this, and St. Peter gives us some ideas here in this outline of important virtues here that, like I said, are just in providence, come up in this way to help us to understand better the duties and responsibilities of fatherhood on this Father's Day. What I'd like to do today for the rest of the sermon is to approach this notion of Father's Day and to give some encouragement to your Catholic fathers and husbands and the work that they do in a little bit of a different manner. Um, there are many things that we've often discussed over the years and books that you've read and other things like that. Instructions or, or encouragement from other people too on the works of Christian fatherhood and how it can be of great benefit. I'd like to do it in a comparative way here to be able to show how God in working with the things that are, exist in the family life and then the family life comparing it also to the way of human life as God has established it can show for fathers their duties and responsibilities and where their great strengths can lie. What I want to do is reflect upon the points, you know, we've often heard that, that women are called the heart of the family, that the mother, the wife is the heart of the family. What she does, what she says, what she brings to the family can very much bring peace and, and order and there's so many different things like that to the family. It's a very important duty that she has. What I'd like to do today is characterize the father as the soul of the family. It's, and this is not my own thoughts. This has come up from spiritual writers from before. But it's an important consideration because if we, if we take the whole concept as a whole, you see how husband and wife, mother and father, work together in a family just like heart and soul work in the human body. And by doing this can see better and better not only the responsibilities, but the graces God gives to be a good husband and a good father in a family. 
When we talk about the heart, we said the heart is in reality an organ of the body. You know, it's this fleshy thing that we've got within us. It's necessary for human life. All hope of any lifeblood going through all of us that we need comes from the heart. If the heart is defective in any way, that lifeblood that we need may not get to us or may not get to us as it should through the entire body, and so the body will become sick. The heart is also a symbol of love. A couple days ago was the Feast of the Sacred Heart. Jesus uses that as a symbol for us of himself, demonstrating to us, he says, Behold this heart which has so loved men. He wanted the devotion of the Sacred Heart of Jesus and the image of his Sacred Heart to be brought forth to demonstrate to us the love, the mercy of God toward men. Poets and so many other different people, greeting cards and whatever, show the heart. They look at the heart as being the symbol of human love, love one for another. Philosophers ages ago were convinced that anything of emotions came from the heart. More modern philosophy recognizes that the heart itself, a fleshy thing, is not the source, the residing area of any points of emotions, but it is that symbol of it. It, it just shows, it gives that, it's described for us, and the channel for the emotions of love and joy and pain and so many things like that all seem to come from the considerations of the heart. When we talk about the soul, though, the soul is not a fleshy organ. Okay? The soul is spiritual. The soul is higher in that way than the heart because it is spiritual, it's not made up of parts. As such, there, it will not become defective. It will not die. God has made it that way. God has created the soul uniquely for each person. The Mormons have a particular thought where they think where souls come from. It's that after Mormon husbands and wives die, they have some, I don't know if it's spiritual relations up there. I can't figure it out. But anyway, at some particular point, they give birth to spirit children. And those spirit children are the ones that come down to the souls of men and come and occupy them. No. God creates our souls. God creates them uniquely for us at the time when life comes. That unique soul comes into existence from nothing. And it's that that is the life principle is here. It's that very point of life principle that begins at conception of why we say that abortion is the great evil that it is. Because the soul... The life principle is there right at the start from Almighty God, right at the beginning of life. A unique act of creation, uniquely for you and for me, the soul that is given. This soul that we have is the ultimate life principle by which we think, we feel, and our will works. All that we talk about the nobility in man, his reason and free will, comes to us because of this soul that we have within us. Now, man has what's called a rational soul. That means the soul has, is the source of his reasoning power and where his free will comes from. There are other souls out there. I'm not going to go through big lectures in philosophy here, but, the, but when studying about soul, life, principle, life as God has made it, plants have a life principle. They of themselves can't exist. They have a life principle. Some like to call it a soul, but it's a life principle. Once that leaves, or when the plant dies, this, that life principle is gone. Animals, too, have a life principle. Some may call it a soul. But once again, when that animal dies, that soul, that life principle, disappears. Not so with the human soul. The human soul lives on. It's spiritual. Once created by God, it lives forever. It has a... a um, a destiny given to it by God to either share the rewards of virtue um, practiced on earth to bring eternity in heaven or the punishments in hell because of selfishness and giving over to a life of sin. And that's for eternity, forever. Souls just don't cease. They continue on. With this consideration then about the souls, we start to see that this is what separates, this is what makes man different from the animals. This is one of our great arguments against evolution. Evolution cannot be, cannot exist as something that's out there, not Darwinian evolution, where we come from species to species, from plant to animal to man. Because you can't come from a life principle where there is no reasoning ability to all of a sudden judge the, jump this huge gap 
I mean, it's so huge, there is no way for anyone to be able to gap to say that an animal now becomes man and now has reasoning ability. What, just because he thought about it and over generations and generations, over millions of years, finally came up with the reasoning ability to know right from wrong and how to think and add one plus one equals two? Yeah. Yeah. It's the unique creation by God of what the soul is that makes it the important thing that we have. Okay, all this being said, let me try and put it together to what I was saying in the beginning, a, a, a way I want to approach this for Father's Day. Women, like we said, are the heart of the home. Their duty, uniquely established by God for them, and they are given sacramental grace at the time of marriage to assist them to establish in their home a spirit of love, a spirit of peace, a spirit of sense of direction, points of prayers, all these particular things there. The woman... The Christian woman, the Christian wife, can help to teach her, her husband what the spirit of love can be. You know, some people, <laughs> and some people try to liken it as a, a, a taming of things that go on. You know, all of a sudden it's this monster there, and the woman comes along and tame along. I'm not saying that. But what I am saying with this, what I am saying at this particular point, is that that's the power and influence that a good Christian wife and mother has. She has that same good influence that can inspire the bond of love among family members. It's that love that is based on the love of God that each one has, and through that love of God can have that love for one another and bring peace and harmony to the home. But where does the husband and father fit in? I've likened him, like I've said, to the soul. First of all, what the husband, the Christian husband, the Christian father brings to the home. He brings a rock and foundation as husband. It's the duty of man, he's supposed to be the rational creature here, the one who can rise up above emotions to be able to keep things settled, to be able to keep his head in the midst of all the worst of times, at the mighty, to be humble under the mighty hand of God in days of visitation, to be sober in times when that sobriety is really needed. Again, not from alcohol and the abuse of that, but the maturity that comes with Christian works and God's grace. He brings that to the home and helps his wife in that particular way. In that way, husband and wife work as the great effort together in the home, sanctifying each other as God had planned from all eternity. In general, as the father of the family, the husband, the, the father rather, is the protector and provider for both wife and, and, and family. This he fulfills in his nature, as all these social you know, workers and people like that, you know, archaeologists or social archaeologists, what do they call themselves? trying to show how you know, man is from his destiny or the way he has made, the way he has evolved. He is the Igor type person out there out to beat people with clubs and go get you know, food and beat it and bring it in and cook it. That's not what I'm talking about here with man. But man does have a destiny from God, a way he has created him to fulfill in his nature, to be the provider, to be the head, to be the one that takes the role of leadership in the house. And that's what the soul is like in the body. Like the soul, which is the principle of life for the body, because without the soul, this whole stuff that makes up our body is nothing. We call it death when the, body, when the soul leaves the body. That's what we call death. There is no reason at all, period, why there should be life in this thing called our body. None whatsoever, except for the soul. There's no battery in here. The heart doesn't have that, and yet the heart is so important. Where does it get its function? Where does it get its power? From the soul. In the family, the husband and father is this principle of spiritual life for the family here. Through him brings, comes in the graces of spiritual life to the home. God has a plan. He has a plan here for every Christian family. The graces he will give to the family in general will come through the Father and out to the rest of the family. Just as the wife may be a point of bringing inspiration, the husband, the father, by his activity, by his prayer life, by his action in that way, brings life to the house, spiritual life. Because after all, when it comes down to living as a family and living as creatures for God, destined for eternity, what other life is there that is so important? None. None. 
The Father leads all, all members of himself. Himself, taking on that leadership role, to lead all to eternal life through participation in the sources of grace, the mass, the sacraments, prayer, so many other different things like that. By his example, he insists people there. Conversely, and this is an important consideration, that the Father, because of the grace in his own soul, can help to bring this spiritual life to the members of the family. What happens if the Father has a living soul himself? He's very much alive, but that soul is dead through sin. There's a blockage from grace. Maybe the members of the family gain graces on their own, but all the graces that God wants given to the family that could be there and should be there are not there because the Father is not living up to his Christian duties, not in the way that God had planned it to be. The Father brings knowledge to the family. When we talk about this, this is what it said about the soul, that the soul is the source of all the knowledge that comes into the thing. I'm not going to go into whole points of philosophy, but it's a really interesting thing that how through the five senses of the body, the soul knows nothing. It's within the body here. It has no source of knowledge of itself. It gains that knowledge through the senses. If any of you have gone to college and studied wrong philosophy, not Thomistic philosophy, you're going to be thinking a totally different thing right now. What I'm telling you here is Catholic philosophy, Thomistic philosophy. It's what you're supposed to be thinking about how the source of knowledge and where knowledge comes from. It comes through the senses that God has given to us. Through each of these senses that comes to inform the soul, and then through that, there's this whole process of coming through this, this, this thought that comes out to an idea in the imagination. It's, a, it's an interesting process that, like I said, it's a, it's a philosophical point, not that I'm talking down to and saying you couldn't understand. It just takes too long to try to explain it. But it's a wonderful process of showing that through these senses here, all the knowledge that the soul can have to come up with the ideas, the points of imagination, all that come through the senses, inform the soul, and through that come out everything else that we think, say, and do. The father is that way in the family. The good Christian father brings the proper knowledge to the family. Through his own knowledge of things and Catholic principles and what he knows he should do, he brings that right study of principles to the family. He is a man of principle, and as a man of principle, he teaches this principle to all whom he influences to make sure that that principle sticks. He has learned it. He is sure of it. He is confident in it by prayer and his own study. And in that way, accomplishes great things in the home. Finally, and this, there's so many other things I guess I could use in, in points of comparison here, but one final point of consideration here is that the father has an influence in the home that's never ending. Remember said about the soul, it will never die? The father's influence is never ending. How many times can like we say about our fathers have taught, said this or that? And even though there may be children and rebellious at times when they've been taught things by a father and then just blow it all off as though it's not important or they're arguing about it because they don't want to hear it at that time, but later on in life they bring it back and say, my dad taught me this. The father's influence is lasting. The father is always the father no matter how old his children can be. Yes, he may treat them a little differently, but his influence is still there. <laughs> before my parents died, I took care of uh, both of them. I just assisted them in their living there before they passed away. And my dad was still my dad. It didn't matter if I wore this Roman collar. There would be times he would come up and make sure he gave me some advice and this and this and this. And I would just say, yes, Dad, thank you, because he was my father. And he was always going to be a father to the end. That's what good fathers do. Husbands and wives are an essential team in the family. Each works in the family much like God made the soul and the heart to work together in the human body. While there is no quality of life without the heart working in its proper way, there is no life at all without the soul in the body. There is no quality of life in the family without a good Christian mother, but there is no Christian life in the family without a good Christian father. The demonstration of that, I think, from what I've just said already today, proves the point. If we want a Christian family, the greatest source of it comes through the Christian father and him working and bringing those graces to the family. To those who are fathers, my prayer for you is that you'll be the good Christian father and, and husband in the home. 
to those who believe your vocation is to be a husband and father and a family sometime in the future in God's time and plan. My prayer for you as you understand well this important vocation and the time in which we live, it's such a quite, a, quite a time to bring a family into the world and take on the responsibility to raise it. But God will give you the grace if he gives you that vocation to assist you in that way, to accomplish and fulfill all of these particular points. For both classifications, fathers, those who someday will be fathers, my prayers are for you this day, that you'll be the true soul of the marriage that you have the true soul in your homes, helping, guiding, directing, giving the good example that must be done by the power of grace that God gives. So important today in society that we have good fathers so that we can have good families and through that have a decent society. Responsibility is big with fatherhood to do what they must do as husband and, and, and father in a family. My prayer for you today as you will live up to that responsibility. Though the challenge may big, be big, God gives the grace to live up to it, no matter how big it may be. Be confident in prayer, and you'll see God with you each step of the way. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.